I'm so glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I I love your podcast. It has been such an amazing um, just source of just a good stuff um, for me since I got my diagnosis. So thank you. <laughs> ah, I love that. So how long ago were you diagnosed? Um, what is time? Um, it was about, I think it was about a year ago that I got my um, official diagnosis from the psychiatrist. Um, so yeah, about a year ago. Wow. Okay. So that's pretty impressive in the UK, right? I mean, the way I feel like the waiting list now is years long, even if you go in the private sector, it's, it really is. And it's about to become a whole, um, I was going to say shit show, am I allowed to swear? Um, yes, of, of <laughs> Um, cause I don't know if you've seen, but we had, um, uh, an investig an investigative journalism uh, yes. thing, um, which I have not watched yet, but, um, the fallout of which I know is just going to be, um, some endless BS. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's difficult. People, have, people wait years and I just got really lucky because in the area where I am, um, I got a referral from my GP through our right to choose system, which means that if there's a big waiting list on the NHS, you can get referred privately. Um, so I got really lucky with that. Um. I got in before the rush, I guess. Yeah, right. It feels like every country has their own shit show when it comes to not only diagnosis, but then access to medication and where the costs lie. Like, it's fascinating to me, uh, having grown up in Canada and now being in the U.S. where the medical system is a disaster, you know, the healthcare system is such a disaster. Uh, but there are ways, you know, in which the privatization of a lot of this stuff has been beneficial. I, you know, especially not beneficial, uh, because I feel like there's, it, there's, you know, nothing really beneficial about two tiered healthcare, but when you're talking about like speed and, and impatience and all the stuff that comes around wanting to get your diagnosis as fast as possible, the U S is like, sure, we'll diagnose you. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know, it's funny, like my husband, but with my kids, this is a totally, this is, I think this is the earliest I've ever had this kind of tangent, but just um, my husband, when we had my kids diagnosed, they were both diagnosed with an online company and uh, it was like a full psych evaluation that was done remotely. And he was basically like, well, you're paying them. They'll tell you whatever you want to hear. And like, he just planted that seed of doubt, right? Which has always been there. Um which I don't yeah. believe, but it's like, you know, it's, it's, I think it's definitely a question that should be out there. I think it's naive for Ooh. us to avoid that, but at the same time, yeah, it's so, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Anyway, let's not talk about that. I, I, I haven't wanted to touch that expose with a 10 foot pole uh, <laughs> yeah. because same. it is so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, so you were diagnosed about a year ago and you were 43, right? Is that what you... I yes, know. I am now 44. I was trying to work out earlier how old I was because I knew you were going to ask me that question. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was 43. <laughs> it is so weird. Like, was this, is uh, is that a pandemic thing that we have no sense of time? Because I feel like also that's an, a neurodivergent thing, which is just maybe with, with working memory where we're always like, how old am I? I always have to work backwards. Even today, I was like, what grade are my kids at? Like, I, it's yeah. <laughs> so many yeah, I don't know. of I those think, numbers. Like, I think the pandemic definitely made it worse, but I have always struggled with that. Like people ask me how old I am and I will either not know, or I will say something that's totally wrong and then be like, that's not true. Um, and it's, yeah, but the pandemic definitely made it worse because it compressed like three years into one. So Right. Yeah, I know. Um, okay. So, and you know, you had mentioned when you first reached out that you were, when you were diagnosed, it was a surprise to nobody. So what was happening? What, what, kind of what were some of the signs or what were some of the things that you related to the traits that you related to where you were like oh it's not just me it's ADHD so there were there were so many but um I think that the things that really struck home are the, are the things that probably um made me feel the most shame um about like the the stuff that I was dealing with so um like I got, I got fired twice and I joke about that a lot. And the joking is to cover up the extreme shame that I feel about it because it's just, it's not, it's not cool to get fired. Like no matter how, no matter how entrepreneurs be like, oh, I'm unemployable, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, you know, that's not cool. So, um, so there was, there was that, um, I had a, had a lot of jobs, ever changing hobbies and interests, that kind of thing. Um, accidentally becoming um a sheep keeper which was, is one of my husband's favorite. Um, oh, this is Vicky's latest ridiculous thing um I just I came home literally came home with a baby a wonky sheep um and was like we have a sheep and he's just like 
right, okay, and now we have three sheep and it's a whole thing. So um, so stuff like that. Where, and... did, where do you come upon a wonky sheep? Where, was he just on the side of the road? No, I went to I went to stay with a friend of mine um, and she ha- she rented a cottage on a farm and so we were just wandering around and, and the farmer had just been lambing and we were, oh, how's it going? And he's like, oh, it's great, we haven't lost any this year, but we might have to, I might have to knock this little one on the head and he picked up this like adorable lamb. Oh. Like, he's got a wonky leg and if I can't straighten it out, he's going to be no use and it's going to be painful and all the rest of it. And I was just like, give him to me, I will take him home. Um, and so I did. <laughs> Um, and yeah, just chucked him in the back of the car, took him home, and my husband's just like, oh my good god, what's happening? What's happening? <laughs> and you can't have just one sheep, because they're a flock animal, so now we now we have three sheep. So, <laughs> so that is, um, yeah, that's, that's one thing, but just like my inability to be on time, no matter how hard I try, is that, that is just, I try so hard, I'm better on it now, because I've got a lot of you know, I've spent 43 years putting things in place to kind of, you know, make it make it easier for myself. But um, it was just that, oh, I don't know, just people would say, oh, you know, if you're late, it shows disrespect for the person that you're meeting. And, and it's like, it, it, that's not it. It's not it. I, I, I kind of had this, um, like, if, if something starts, so for example, this podcast interview um I put early in my calendar because it is the only way I was I was going to be able to get here um I've got an appointment later uh which is also early in my calendar because I know that what I do is I see the time and I'm like oh okay that's what time I have to start getting ready and it's like I cannot make my brain go that's what time I have to be there it's like that's what time I have to start getting ready so um that kind of thing um total time blindness so I had a conversation with my husband I thought everybody suffered from this, but apparently not. Um, and he would be like, okay, let's do a little experiment to see if you can work out how long something takes. Um, what time, I can't remember what question he asked me, but it was like, it's like, what time is it now? And um, like half an hour ago, I'd kind of had a look and it was like 9 p.m. And I was like, uh, I don't know, like five past nine? And it was, I was like 25 minutes out. And so there's things like that, like little things like that, boredom, lack of object permanence, making me a terrible friend and daughter and sister and, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. So all loads of things that once I got diagnosed was just like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Maybe I can stop help hating myself quite so much and start figuring out what to do about this. Mm, yeah, I know. I feel like we've talked about that too. We're just like, none of that is on the DSM, right? None of that is, none of the shame, none of the emotional stuff. Uh, so where was it like TikTok videos or where were you where were you getting this information that you were kind of like oh that's really relatable <laughs> so I was getting it from um friends that also um have ADHD um mm. and yeah TikTok videos um Instagram that kind of thing um I as soon as I get interested in something I get really interested so I just started reading everything and I was just like oh this is really interesting um that I relate to totally, that I relate to totally. Uh, loads of stuff about the differences between boys and girls because it never even occurred to me when somebody asked me, you know, have you ever been diagnosed with ADHD? And I was like, how very dare you? I absolutely have not. Um, and I was totally affronted because I knew nothing about it. Um, and I was just like, isn't that for naughty boys? Because when I was at school, when you were at school as well, I guess, um, it just wasn't a thing that girls had, definitely. It wasn't really a thing that kids had. Um, and so it was just like no that's that's not me I'm not I was never the naughty one causing disruption in classes or anything like that and so I can't it can't possibly be me but as soon as I started looking into it a bit more I was just like oh that's really that's really interesting because all of my inattentiveness and and kind of hyperactivity um just manifested differently so like I'm really super fidgety I can't rest it's like the whole driven by a motor thing it's like yeah (laughs) yes and it drives my husband up the wall he's like can like I would really like to see you relax every now and then and I'm like don't know how don't know how to do that um and my version of relaxing apparently is not the same as as kind of other people's and just that this idea that um I think I saw I think that the most relatable thing that I saw was um a meme that was like I did not realize until today that when other people say they are they're feeling lazy, it means they don't want to do it and they can't be bothered. But when I say I'm lazy, it means I've been trying really hard to do the thing that I want to do, like, I don't know, clean my room. Um, but I just can't. And I, I hadn't made that I hadn't made that differentiation. So like I would I would be like, oh I'm really lazy because that would that would be what I would see other people, you know, oh they're just sitting on the sofa doing nothing. They can't be asked to do the thing that they wanted to do. Um, but for me it would be like I'm in my head, I'm like screaming at myself to do the thing that I want to do. And it's just it's like there's um I kind of likened it to it's like 
an extremely heavy and angry bear sitting on my chest not allowing me to get up and do the thing that I want to do um and so that for me was a real like oh that that's really that was exciting to read because I was like maybe I'm not like a lazy trash panda after all maybe there's something else going on there (laughs) I think I've actually used that phrase called lazy trash panda. Uh, you know, it's funny. Well, I'd, I feel like this is what always used to confuse me about a d- diagnosis of depression too, right? Which was never feeling like it fit. And so many of us are diagnosed with depression. And I think mm-hmm. we genuinely have it. I mean, I think most of us have the shame and the what's wrong with me. And I'm a terrible human and all of this stuff that feels like depression. But for me, it was never the lack of desire. Like you said, it was the desire to do all the things, the extreme like excitability and Mm. desire and ideas and wanting to do all these things, but just feeling incapable. Like, like the, yeah, right. Just feeling like there is a giant bear on my chest or just feeling like I don't know where to start. I can't do it. Like getting in my own way, the paralysis was much more relatable than just that the lack of lack of desire. And so that never felt like depression to me. And I, you know, and was always sort of very confused by like, what is that? Like always like, is this a learning disability or what, you know, why is there that I didn't really understand or even know what executive dysfunction was. It wasn't a term I had ever heard. Um, or if I did, I hadn't taken note of it, uh, until, until my diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah, same. It's it's such and it's such a weird thing to describe to people as well. If people haven't experienced it, they don't get it. They just don't get it. And it's so it's really difficult to try and kind of explain it to to people um, because they're just like, well, what do you mean? Just stand up and do the thing. And it's like, yeah, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) How does that work? Um, And, you know, there are there are ways that you can you can make it work. And there is, you know, techniques and there's I know some people find medication super helpful and so so there's all sorts of ways to to do it but it's like that initial if you don't know what's going on it just feels so weird it's like well what is was literally what's wrong with me you know there's there's obviously something wrong with me because everybody else is finding this thing really easy and I cannot I cannot get my ass off the chair so so what is happening right right well and not only that but then I think paralysis is so different from relaxation and so for many of us I think we experience paralysis we experience the idea of like sitting on the couch scrolling our phone not being able to do anything and so for all intents and purposes it looks like we're relaxing and yet it's like why am I so unhappy and you know uh and and not and exhausted all the time uh I should feel relaxed because I haven't done anything all day and so it was like that feeling of like like you said like relaxation to us looks very different and I've kind of had to embrace that even just with going on vacations or like ways in which downtime and recharging and restoring ourselves doesn't look Look like lying on the couch. In fact, if I'm lying on the couch, there's prob I probably need help, <laughs> to, you know, yeah. to get get somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's so interesting because it's like in, and I think part of the reason it's so exhausting when certainly for me anyway when I'm kind of sitting there and like doom scrolling or playing lemmings or whatever it is I'm doing on my phone it's like I am like I'm physically like almost physically fighting myself and you know there's a battle going on in my brain and that's really tiring it's really exhausting um plus there's the whole like voice going you're a trash panda you're useless you're blah, blah, blah. all of all of the kind of internal negative nonsense as well that goes with it and and that that's exhausting so <laughs> it's like no wonder no wonder we're knackered all the time <laughs> right I know <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like there's so much to unpack, unpack when it comes to it, that feeling of exhaustion. And again, I didn't realize everybody didn't feel that way, right? Like I, it's really hard to to like judge your own experience versus what is a quote unquote normal ex- experience. And I always felt like that with exhaustion too, which was like maybe I, maybe I don't sleep well. I don't know. Like you know, all of those questions where it's like maybe I need a better night's sleep, or maybe I need this, or maybe I be. Um, but like then you. I remember like the first time it occurred to me how exhausting it must be to mask, right? And that was something that was yeah. like, oh yeah, like we we really or even like you were talking about like how much how much energy we put into showing up on time or how much energy we put into remembering things and how like it is just so much of that underwater paddling uh yeah. that um that nobody sees that we're like, oh okay, yeah, it makes sense why I'm tired all the time. <laughs> 
Yeah. And you're right, the masking thing is, the masking thing is, I don't, it's, it's a thing. And it's like, I know that, because like everybody has personas that they wear for different situations and, and all the rest of it. And so that's that's fine. But it's like, it's the, like you say, it's it's the, en- the amount of energy that you put into appearing normal, you know, whatever normal is with my air quotes. Um, but yeah, it's just like, and I, I didn't realise, I did not realise, I like still now think, where was I when the how to interact socially with people handbook was given out <laughs> as, as a child because like I would watch children and I watch children now like just interacting and like being really kind of eloquent and graceful and and you know they're, they're doing their backwards and forwards and I'm like how do they do that because I just I used to stand on the sidelines and I used to study people it would be like I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch these people to find out what conversations they're having and how they're working and I, w- I would still say the most inappropriate stuff and I have a funny story for you if you would like to hear it in a minute but but it would be like it would be like okay so how is this interaction going to go how am I going to have this conversation um what am I saying what is my face doing for a start because every now and then my husband will nudge me and he'll be like sort your face out because he's told me that if I think somebody is an idiot they can instantly tell um and so it's just like I <laughs> he finds I it really that. funny sort your face out <laughs> yeah he finds it really funny but I'm like this is going to get me punched at some point um so <laughs> but yeah it's just like the amount of energy that goes into to, and I don't know if this is the same for all ADHD people or if it's just me, but like just trying to figure out how to be in a group of people, like when to talk, when to not talk, when to, you know, when to say, when to give an opinion, how to not overshare. Like I missed, I missed that lesson. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it, it's very tiring. Well, <laughs> and not only that, but the hangover that comes mm-hmm. after conversations, right? With the overthink of like, oh, I can't believe I said that. What did that mean? What was their reaction? What are they going to think? Like, I feel like, especially with oversharing, right? Where you, I come away from conversations and for three days, I'll have a hangover of just replaying yeah. it and all the things I did that I was like, what were you thinking? why did that come out you know it just (laughs) um so wait I want to hear your funny story oh my god okay so this is this is a few years this is a few years ago now and we were on holiday with a group of friends um on a climbing holiday on Greek island um I used to do rock climbing um and we we had been talking about how when you're a kid adults would say that thing where they're like oh you you eat so much you must have hollow legs um, you know, where do you put it all? You must have hollow legs. And about 10 minutes later, because I was still, my brain was still mulling over the possibilities of having hollow limbs and for food storage um, kind of solutions. Um, and <laughs> one, of our, one of our friends had said, um, had said, oh, I'm, this is so delicious, but I'm so full, I can't eat anymore. And so I just said, why don't you open up your legs and just stuff it all in? <laughs> and the whole, like, the whole table was like silence for about 30 seconds as everybody just looked at me. And I was like, what? And then somebody repeated it back to me and I was just like, oh, that's not at all what I meant. And kind of everybody else had obviously moved on with the conversation and I was still thinking about hollow legs. And then what came out of my face did not resemble what I meant to say. <laughs> just like, that, still, that still wakes me up at, at 3 a.m. And that was, that was like 10 years ago. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's funny now, but it's just that, that is the kind of, that is the kind of, sums up the kind of struggle I have is like I will fixate on something from a conversation and that will go off in my head and the conversation will move on and I will carry on with with what I'm thinking about and everybody is like what <laughs> well not only that I which makes me laugh at how many times there's like well the con there's no context to what you say but it makes absolute sense to you because you're making these rapid fire connections during conversation which I think is highly neurodivergent but also just like I feel like the one thing we all have in common is we all tend to say things like, does that make any sense? Right? (laughs) What I, because I'm not sure it makes sense to me. So does it like make sense to you? But the fact that we're constantly like what comes out of our face, as you just said, which is hilarious, but you know, it's like, does that resemble, is that at all logical? Like having no idea um, if this, our stream of consciousness is making sense to anybody. Yeah. But the phrase, does that make sense? comes out of my face a lot and um yeah everybody I know is really used to me saying that and they're like 50% of the time yeah it makes perfect sense and 50% of the time mm, not so much (laughs) right I know um you know I was just reminded of when my daughter was in maybe second or third grade she wanted to call somebody on the phone and she had never used the phone I mean she really hadn't talked on the phone much and I didn't realize that 
speaking on the phone was an acquired skill, or at least it was in my household. And so we had to sit down and go and we practiced phone conversations and we practiced like, if this person says this, what do I say this? So we had all of these like scripts that she was memorizing. And at the time, I didn't realize, like, neither of us was diagnosed with ADHD. We're both self-diagnosed with autism. So it was like, I didn't realize what a neurodivergent experience that whole thing was at the time. It, it, to me, I was like, oh, I didn't realize that people have to do this. But okay, here we go. And like, sitting down and being so panicked and also like methodical about social interactions that now I look back and I'm like, oh, yeah, the signs were there all along. <laughs> <laughs> so do you find like do you find phone calls difficult and stressful oh my god yeah i mean i especially when especially if somebody just calls me out of the blue i won't answer the phone and and, and i find that strange because like we you know a generation ago we all just had a one phone in our house that we you know it would ring and everybody would be excited you'd be like we'd have no idea who it was and that was how people existed and now i'm like oh no like we need to arrange ahead of time if we are going to talk on the phone i need i need warning i need like mental yeah. preparation yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Because like I obviously I, I remember I don't, this weird generation that we are that is like remembers life pre-internet and also kind of post-internet and it's just I miss people not knowing where I am every hour of every day. But that's a, a different thing. <laughs> but it's like yeah, I just find like I will literally glare at my phone if it rings. I will be like, how dare you? How dare what? you? It's and such an affront. <laughs> And I get really stressed about it. And then if I know somebody's going to ring, I will go into waiting mode for a start because that's mm. the thing that I do. Um, and then I will sweat a lot. Um, and then I will babble. And then when it comes to say goodbye, I will either just put the phone down because I don't know how to end it or I will still be there on the end of the phone being like, hey, bye, 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 K, K, bye. <laughs> it's just like a whole, a whole thing. And I do the same thing on Zoom calls as well. So look forward to that at the end of the I call. was going to say, I should do a montage of the end of every uh interview i've had on this podcast because there is always that awkward like over goodbye which is like okay then okay then all right goodbye <laughs> please turn that into like a reel or something I would, right I would love seriously <laughs> um that's funny right but it's so yeah it is it is it's, uh what do, i don't even know what I'm to say now i'm like social interactions um but yeah it is fascinating um just thinking about like how this diagnosis is so eye-opening right and it's so that in itself I think is really difficult to articulate to people who you know especially yeah. if you're like oh everybody when I was diagnosed people were like oh yeah I get that's not a big surprise but like how to even explain to other people how life-changing this is just like oh like yeah. it is yeah I don't know yeah because I've had people say you know well why do you why do you need a label you know why is why is that useful and I was like well a it's not a label um and you know it's it's it is what it is. And B, it just allowed me, and I'm still working on this, but it's allowing me to let go of so much shame about who I am and what I've done. Because, you know, this, I mean, everybody's got stuff in their past that they're not proud of, but like, I've done stuff that I'm really not proud of. And I'm not excusing it at all, because I don't think there is, you know, there's not an excuse for bad behavior. But now I understand it, I can start to let go of the shame that I've got around it and be like, okay, well, I screwed up, everybody screws up. Um, and so now I know why I can never make that kind of mistake again. Like I'll make new ones, I'm sure, but I can, you know, I'm never going to go back and make that one again. And so for me, getting the diagnosis was just it was really, it was, it was a bit of a rollercoaster. It was really upsetting. I cried a lot. I still do sometimes when I, when I kind of think about it. Um, but it was also such a relief because I was just like, like I said before, it's like, I'm not, I'm not a trashy person. Um, you know, I didn't do, I don't, I didn't do the things that I did on purpose. I don't annoy people on purpose. I don't, none of this stuff is on purpose. And it's just allows you to let go of that kind of that part of the identity and have this other identity instead, which I find, I find really, really helpful i know that not everybody does i've got a couple of friends who are who suspect they have adhd and they're like they're not interested in getting a diagnosis but they're also a lot younger and they kind of had an upbringing where they were allowed to be who they were and like think times have changed since i was a, a kid since i was young and so they've had a lot more freedom to be able to you know they weren't forced to sit in a classroom all day doing job doing schoolwork that they hated it's like they had they had the freedom to go and do other other stuff to kind of use their energy and use their creative energy in different ways and so they they don't really find it useful to have that um diagnosis which i totally get totally respect but for me it's been it really has been a game changer because it's just 
it's just been a relief and you know and trying to explain that to other people is sometimes really frustrating so I've mostly given up trying it's like well you know you do you I'll do me that's fine um and like trying to talk to my parents as well because they are I don't know how much of this to say on a, on a podcast but it's like uh, but they are for sure like my nana for example she she died a few years ago but like she used to she was known for hating loud noises and now I look back on her and who she was and her personality and you know quite a lot of members of my family are a bit weird um, and I mean that mostly in the nicest possible way and it's just like it, this stuff runs in families and so to be able to know why and why we struggle with certain things and you know who in your family might be neurodivergent I think it's just super useful because if I'd known like my mom is like well isn't everybody like that and I'm like no but that's what people with undiagnosed things say to their children so <laughs> I don't know where that ramble started or where it was going but um, yeah. uh, I know right I had a thought and I lost it too um when you were talking I should have written it down uh but yeah you know no, lost it. Oh, oh the label oh, thing. Well. The, the, yeah, the getting, the getting diagnosed. Oh, that's what it was, right? Well, and, and I think um, for me, it's really important. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. But one... <laughs> So for me, I think it's really, I totally agree because I have a 16 year old daughter and it's one of those things where I spend a lot of mental energy thinking about what is ADHD, what is autism, where's the overlap, is this this, is this that, it's really important for me for whatever reason to categorize these things in my head and, and to be like, what is causing this, what is causing this, what are we even talking about? Like, th I feel like those are the questions I ask a lot on this podcast, which is like, what even is ADHD? Is it our brains that we're talking about? Is it our actions that we're talking about? Like what, like I obsessively think about categorizing and then there, you know, and then I'll talk to autistic people who are like, yeah, that's, that's pretty autistic. But then I'll ask my 16 year old daughter, cause she's so similar. And we have a lot of the like very, you know, similar characteristics around rigid thinking. And, um, you know, for me, I'm sort of like, do you think you might be autistic? And she's like, I don't know, maybe like for her, it, it's not important. Like she, she's just is who she is. And, and mm -hmm. I find it interesting that for her, she can live in that ambiguity. Whereas for me, ambiguity is torture. <laughs> um, and I need answers and I'm not getting them and it frustrates me. Um, so, but yeah, you know what that. you were talking about? Well, well, and not only that, but like when you were talking about the, the information of the diagnosis, one of the things I talk about a lot on this podcast is how it feels like I have notes in the margin, which is the name of your podcast, which I thought was really cool. Cause that's a phrase I use all the time when I talk about what it feels like to have this diagnosis where I'm like, oh, there's little, it's like little footnotes to all of these strange behaviors that I felt a lot of shame around or, you know, or just confusion. Like you said, like mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things where maybe somebody either has said, or at least I've been convinced that they thought I don't care about them because I don't remember things about them. Right. Or, or I'm late or um, I'm not, we're not communicating well. And then you start to question in yourself, well, do I not care about them? Am I a terrible human being? Right? Like you start to internalize those beliefs mm -hmm. and then that because that defines you. And this is such an opportunity to, to start to unravel that and redefine yourself. It's like, no, I always meant well, I always had the best of intentions. Uh, and yeah. to be able to embrace that identity more than the sort of accidental asshole identity that I think a lot of us <laughs> Right? Yeah. That's a, if I could rename ADHD, that's what I think I would set a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, so now I'm curious because you have been coaching book writing. I want to talk about this we, um, because I think it's so interesting to look at through a neurodivergent lens, right? Um, because, uh, and, and I wrote a book and I've often talked about how like the, the circumstances under which I wrote the book were so perfect. I don't know if I could ever replicate that. Um, so how has your, because you've been doing this for so, you've been doing it for at least a decade, right? How has your diagnosis changed your view of kind of what you do as a book writing coach, or I guess let's even start with sort of your experience as a book writing coach. And, and you've noticed that there are neurodivergent approaches, uh, that, and you know, that there are a lot, there is a lot of advice around book writing that is aggressively unhelpful to a neurodivergent brain. So, so I just want to know your thoughts about, you know, tailoring, yeah. tailoring what you do for toward ADHD and autistic brains. Yeah, sure. I love your extremely diplomatic, um, aggressively unhelpful uh, comment. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I I don't know. I even I mean, entrepreneurs I think are a 
you know, you, there's a certain type of person that's drawn to entrepreneurship um, and, and business ownership, I think. And it, it tends to, I think there's a, a high correlation of, of, you know, people with neurodivergence. Um, but I had always attracted people with who, who are neurodivergent and I hadn't really thought anything of it. Um, I was just like, oh, all of these, I'm, I'm a weirdo. All of these weirdos are also here and that's great. And because I, I, by the way, think the term weirdo is great. I love it. I wear it as a, as a, as a badge. Um, but yeah, and so I, I think they came to me because I've always done things a little bit differently. So the, the kind of tradition, like you say, there's a lot of advice out there that I'm sure is super helpful for, um, for kind of normos. But for me, it was just, it was just not, it's like, oh, you know, you need to, you need to dedicate this like big block of time, um, to doing, to doing this book. And it's like, put, put, exclude everything else for the next three months and get your book done. And I'm like, not even like normal people can do that. Like people have children and families and it's like always, always rich white dudes, by the way, who give this advice. Who go um, off to a have... cabin for, in the woods for three months, right? right? <laughs> yeah. And they've got a wife in the background doing all the stuff for them, so they can go and do that. <laughs> Who's um, really pissed like, off. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I need a wife. What is happening? Um, so, um, so yeah. And so there's all this advice and I, I can give you like my favorite one is, is, um, the one that's attributed to Mark Twain, whether he said it or not, I don't know, but it's like eat the frog first. If you tell me to eat the frog first, I will do literally nothing all day because um, if you get me to do the most difficult thing without any kind of priming or anything else, um, ain't gonna happen, it's just not. And not only will it not happen, but I will then feel like trash for the next few days because I will hate myself for it. And it's just like the whole exhausting, you know, head talk thing. Um, and so I have invented what I like to call the dopamine sandwich, um, which is like a slice of dopamine, Frog, not frog, I'm vegetarian. Slice of dopamine, horrible task, um, slice of dopamine. Um, because bread is dopamine for me. I love bread. I feel sorry for people who can't eat bread. Um, and so that's that's what I do. It's like I don't know, it doesn't matter what the dopamine is, but if I'm like, right, I've got to do a thing that I am not looking forward to doing, let's say um receipts for my taxes, which nobody enjoys doing. Um, it's gonna be I am gonna spend five minutes dancing to my favorite tune, or I'm gonna stuff my face full of my favorite chocolates, or I'm gonna play lemmings on my phone for ten minutes, or I'm gonna go for a walk, you know, I'll do something. And then I will ride that dopamine wave into the um, horrible, awful task and trick my brain into doing it before I've noticed because once I'm in it, I can usually focus um, long enough to get it done. And then afterwards I reward myself. So it's not like the traditional do the horrible thing, have a reward afterwards. It's like, no, have the reward now and then do the thing and then reward yourself again. So, and that's kind of one of the things that I think um, I bring to coaching that a, a lot of people, you know, maybe people do it, but that for me instinctively, it was like, oh, if you're struggling to do a thing, I'm not gonna make you sit in a chair and try and do that. That's that's helpful to nobody. And, and it will make you hate the task and you know, you never get your book done. So it's that kind of thinking about you know, how, how do people's brains actually work? And, you know, every ADHD person is different as well. So it's like, how does this person's brain work? What is this person struggling with? What is this person feeling when they're trying to do the thing? And I don't have, like, I have a process that works for me that I will adapt for people, but I will also create processes for people based on, you know, what they want to do and, and how they want to work. And, um, you know, another, another thing that I, do is like people think that writing means sitting down in front of a laptop and kind of tapping out it's like no use the voice notes on your phone I've got a client who is amazing and she writes her books on her voice recorder app on her phone while she's all like tapping into her notes app while she's walking around you know the beach or whatever and and that works really well for her and people don't realize that they're allowed that they're allowed to do that if they want to if they want to write <laughs> you're allowed to do that it's, it's really cool <laughs> <laughs> Even that phrase, like that, you know, that permission to do things your own way, I think is so indicative of how we've lived our lives for so long prior to these diagnoses, which is like, you know, trying so desperately to fit in with the, you know, the common advice. Um, and even when you were talking about tricking your brain, I'm like that, even that phrase, I think that we talk about our brain, like it's this petulant, you know, I I immature roommate that we try to do, <laughs> that we try to deal with all the time and try to trick it to behave. Um, but you're right. I think like there are, there is so much advice that doesn't take into consideration that how fickle momentum is for mm -hmm. our brains, right? And the fact that one thing will work today and it's not going to work tomorrow and we have to surf that. Um, yeah. But yeah, like this assumption that you can just sit down and start writing is I think, you know, a total fallacy. Like that we, yeah. there are ways in which we need to kind of build up um, in, you know, like there's like an on-ramp <laughs> to, yeah. to momentum. 
Um, you know, it's funny. I was just going to say about the Eat the Frog. I did not know that was a Mark Twain quote. I definitely heard that. It had never made any sense to me. And it was actually the Llama Life creators of the app Llama Life um, who who used the phrase eat the cake. And it was the first thing. And, and um, Marie, who created the app, she was like, I'd never heard of that before. But I was just trying to think of like, what's the opposite of doing, you know, doing a fun thing first. Uh, but I really love the idea of a dopamine sandwich that makes perfect sense yeah. to me and i think that's kind of how i operate throughout the day yeah yeah uh, I love that. yeah there's there's like another like you're talking about kind of the momentum thing as well and that you know that that's the thing but i think even even people who are not neurodivergent really struggle with this idea of like how to get started and how to do stuff because i think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how inspiration and motivation work um and this is like exacerbated for people who are neurodivergent as well it's like people think oh I am, you know, I need to be inspired before I can write. And I'm like, that's not how this works. Like we don't, that, that's not how it works. It's like inspiration comes from everywhere and you have to go out and make it. Um, and you can, it doesn't have to be like, I think people think it needs to come from a specific place or like it's bestowed by the, the gods, the Greek gods. And, you know, the romantic poets have a lot to answer for. Um, and so it's like, no, you can, you can go and do anything. It's like, for me, writing is, is not just the writing. It's, it's the process of, it's, it's the dopamine bit before it's like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do the thing that. I find fun because I have ideas that way. That's where my ideas come from. It's like you move your body and your brain works differently. Um, And so there's that. And then there's motivation. It's like, oh, I don't feel motivated to write today. And it's like, well, then you're never going to write. Like, that's not how motivation works. You do the thing and then you then you feel motivated to carry on. And I think people don't generally understand that. It's like, I have to feel motivated, you know, to to go to the gym or whatever it is that you're deciding to do. It's like, I'll go to the gym when I'm motivated. It's like, then you're never going to go. Um, it's, it's, you know, you start doing the thing and then you're like, oh, actually I'm quite enjoying this. And that's where the motivation comes from. And it's like, how do you, the problem isn't the motivation. It's how do you get started? Because Mm -hmm. the motivation will come once you get started. And I think people don't understand that. So like my job is always, how do I get people started? And like I've got so many different things that I can I can give, get people to try and give people to you know depending on what works for them one day or another and, and what doesn't work and it's just like that I think is is one of my biggest strengths is is like I'm gonna look at I'm really I'm gonna really listen to people <laughs> because I'm not just gonna be like I have this thing and this is gonna help you it's like actually you tell me things tell me th- I'm gonna ask you questions that are probably gonna make you feel really uncomfortable and then I'm gonna get you to try stuff that you know some of it might make you feel really uncomfortable some of it will work really well some of it won't work at all um and there's that kind of permission to try stuff and have it fail and try stuff and you know it, it doesn't work for you it doesn't mean that you're broken it means that doesn't work for you and so I think for me that like letting go of that shame as well and I call them the bro marketers it's like oh if this thing doesn't work for you then you're just not trying hard enough and I'm just like you um you know that's that's such nonsense and it's so shamey and it's like well let's maybe maybe your thing isn't that good (laughs) maybe your thing isn't that good or maybe your thing does not work for this type of person or you know whatever and so it's giving people permission to be like try things if they don't work doesn't it's not your fault not necessarily I mean you know there's a there's a line it's like if you're genuinely not being asked then I'm going to call you out on that as well but it's like if this thing is not working and you're really trying then we try something else and we will we'll find something that works so Yeah, I think we also have, there's like this intersection for many of us where we're fiercely self-reliant, which I think comes from masking. I think it comes from difficulty communicating. I think there's a lot of reasons why we tend to want to do things on our own, which is like, I have a hard time explaining what I need right now. So I'm just going to figure this out on my own. But at the same time, really requiring Uh, company and conversation and coaching and help to get past our own selves. And like that feels so essential in so many aspects of life. And yet at the same time, I don't think we do that. Like, I think we tend to be like, oh, it's up to me. I got to figure it out. I got to, I got to know what I'm doing before I even show up. And, and it's quite the opposite. I think like the, the faster you find somebody to step in and help you with this, or even, you, you know, the, the easier it'll be to sort of get out of your own way. That's so interesting that you say that. Cause I've been thinking about this a lot. And at some point I'm going to write something about it when I, when I know more about it and I can do more research, but I do wonder how much like our Western capitalist system has contributed to just making these differences more pronounced and more difficult because it's like, and especially especially in America, but also to um, an extent in the UK as well, there's this like individualistic kind of European, 
it's all about the eye. We have to do it all on our own. We are pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. And you go elsewhere in the world and that is not a thing. And it's like communities come together. People help each other. People work together. And we've lost that somewhere along the way. And I just think that that, like, this is a really unformed thought, but I just think that that really exacerbates the issues that we face because I don't think the problem is with us. It's with the world that we are in and the box that we're trying to fit ourselves into. It's like the world has always had different types of people. Um, One of my favourite neurodivergent people is Temple Grandin and she's like you know if there weren't autistic people there would we would still be gossiping in caves and she's totally I've totally misquoted her but said something like that and it's and, and she's right and it's like the world needs lots of different types of people but it's set up now for a very specific type of person that really doesn't work for many people at all it's like most people can cope in it neurodivergent people really struggle in it and a very narrow band of people thrive in it and that narrow band of people they don't look like most of us and so I just I just think there's a lot to be explored there and there's you know maybe there wouldn't be any such thing as oh people are neurodivergent and they're having issues if the world was different for us because there would be room for everybody right preach right yeah and and i think too it's it gets us to a point where we feel shame around asking for help like we we've Ooh. we have we have decided and not we as an individually we are have decided this for ourselves i mean you know the, the the greater we but the royal we but like the this idea that we um it that it's a failure to ask for help right that we have to wait until we have absolutely are at our wits end before we can invite help as opposed to bringing it in even before you're struggling like even before you've encountered paralysis or issues to just say I anticipate that this is going to be hard for me so I'm worth inviting help right as opposed to like I have to somehow show that I have exhausted all of my own resources before I've asked for somebody else's because we feel so much shame around being in position and you know we've we feel like asking for help is an imposition so the, all of that I feel like yes yeah. I feel like it's probably the Protestant work ethic and capitalism and I think it's more you know it's more prominent in women in terms of how we're socialized and yeah those are all those those see those are all the questions where I'm like is are we talking about ADHD still or are we just talking about capitalism and <laughs> And feminism, right? Um, right mm -hmm. Yeah. But now one of the things that I always feel like I struggle with with writing, because I used to be a much more prolific writer and reader uh, when I was younger. And I feel that as I get older, it's re I, it's almost, I call it like too much information syndrome. Like if you were to ask me to write an essay about something I know nothing about, I would find that really easy because I'll be like, okay, well, I'll just have to go research it really quickly. And, you know, I think the less you know about something, the easier it is to write, but you can get into a situation where you know too much and then it becomes really difficult to process where to start and like to organize those thoughts. And then you're getting your own way. Cause you're like, well, there's always another side to that. And you know, you start to argue with yourself. So that's what I always find really complicated, um, about writing, which is, I just, it's like, especially when it comes to writing about ADHD, I'm just like, I, I, my brain is too full. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. how to sort through that trash. What that can't, that has to be a common problem when it comes to, especially writing nonfiction, right? Like, I feel like that has gotten worse for me as I've gotten older. Yeah, it is. And I, I totally understand because I, I have a similar thing where I'm like, oh, I want to say all of the things. I've got too much information in my head and it just becomes this kind of maelstrom of, nonsense it doesn't make any sense and so yeah there's I mean there's a, f a few things that I do and what, one of the things that I do is I literally force myself to write stuff out like I, I don't allow myself to stop so I will be like I'm only for five minutes it's like I'm not going to make myself do this for you know loads of time it's like I'm going to spend five minutes or ten minutes and I am not allowed to stop writing it's like I literally have to write whatever comes out of my head and I found that for me that can be a really useful way of like the thing that is important to me at the moment will come out. Like if, if I do that, it will come out because I can't physically do lots of things at the same time. So that's that's one thing that I that I do that I find really useful. But another thing is, and I think a lot of people are surprised um by the simplicity of this, is you're just because you're not gonna write about something specific now, it doesn't mean that you discard it forever. And so it's like if you're having like I have at least one notebook by the side of me at all times, like a physical paper one um and so if i'm like trying to work on one thing and i have other things popping into my head they go straight into my journal um because then i don't forget about them um they're there i have um like different places that i can put them i've got post-it notes i've got like colored pens and i kind of say i color code everything that's not true just stuff has different colors and then i 
look at it. Um, but yeah, there's, so I, I do struggle with that as well. Um, I do struggle with the whole, I've got too much information in my head. Um, and what I try and do is start wide and then narrow down. So I'm like, oh, I've got this, I've got that, like, I love digging deep because I think another another problem that we've got with um with the modern world I sound like a really old person now, uh, with, the, with this modern world is like everything is everything is so surface and brief and that's I think that's why people shout at each other on the internet because it's like there's no room for nuance there's no room for depth and it's like all surface level hot takes and so one of the things that I I do I run this thing called micro book magic I get people to write tiny little books um and the thing that I love about it is that, that kind of forces you to go really deep and really narrow into one thing. So so it's like I've got this idea I want to write about all these other things I'm going to make the notes on them but actually how deep can I go into this one single idea and how can I narrow it down even further and you know and then can I narrow that down even further and then you know can I narrow that down just to one sentence and maybe then I can start expanding it out a little bit and so it's like this kind of um expanding and contracting mushroom cloud of of stuff and out of it will come all sorts of other ideas for micro books as well but like I find that drilling right down to the heart of something to be really really useful which I think can be like really useful for people with ADHD because we're really good at hyper focusing on the stuff that we're interested in so it's like how I'm gonna go down this wormhole of like um why are why do goats smell the way they do and suddenly you're down to the goat smelling molecule which is an actual molecule um and then and then it's like oh I can come up from that like what else can you do with goat smell molecules <laughs> right i would much rather write a book about that than a book about something i talk about all the time <laughs> uh it's so true oh gosh and you know i feel like that was something that was very helpful for me when i was writing my book again where it was like it was it was all about going going wide and then getting really really narrow and going wide and getting narrow and and kind of taking myself out of the process and, and becoming, uh, you know, like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm making any sense, <laughs> but, you know, taking myself out of the book and looking at it from very different angles all the time. But again, yes. I don't know. It's one of those things I, I think a lot of us feel like we've got so many books in us and we're so much we know and so we're so fascinated, um, but we don't know where to start. So that's where we need people like you. Now, do you do like, do you work only one-on-one? -on -one? Do you, would you ever do like courses? Because it feels like a lot of this could lend to a lot of sort of guided journaling, guided um, work in a group. Yeah, so... I always have like a thousand ideas for things that I want to do and then I have to run them by. My husband is great at reining me in. He's he's just like, he reminds me of things or he'll be like, come back to me in a week if you're still interested in it and I'll forget about it. Um, but yeah, I do, I, I work... Um, I love working one-on-one -on -one with people, but I like the micro book thing that I do, that's like a small group thing and it lasts for, um, I'm expanding it to five or six weeks actually, but that's, that's a small group thing. And I like to have, you know, 10, 15 people doing that at a time. And that, that is, that's kind of a guided thing. So it's, I will give people everything that they need to be able to do it. I will give them the guidance and, um, you know, there's group calls and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I do, I don't do any, courses at the moment as in you can't kind of and part of the reason for that is actually because of the whole trouble that I've had with the this is the one size fits all and I haven't found a way yet to create I'm going to work on it to create a course that works for people because people's writing like even n not neurodivergent people um are there's, there's so everyone's so different everyone's writing style is so different everyone's writing process is so different that it's just um I'm a bit reluctant because I've seen quite a few book writing courses out there that are like this is the way you do it and they either make me roll my eyes or give me the rage because it's like well quite often what people are doing is teaching other people how to how they would write a book and that's not helpful I mean it's it's it can it can be useful for people to read about other people's writing like I love reading books by right like Margaret Atwood's book and um Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott it's like this is my writing process I love that but nowhere in those books are they saying this is how you're supposed to do it mm -hmm. and and I think that's the the difference for me it's like I don't want to create something where I'm like this is my process and you have to use this process because for me that that was always one of the biggest problems was well this didn't work for me and so what's wrong with me and so I've been a bit reluctant to do it like that but I am going to try and find a way because I feel like there must be a way somehow um but at the moment it's kind of small groups um or one-to-one -one. yeah oh now I want to take your course uh <laughs> no. well it's you know it's funny because um the the course that I had taken when I wrote my book the the single biggest motivating factor was the fact that they there was a time 
you know, deadline. And if you mm -hmm. have you had your book written and completed and published by the deadline, it, they, you know, chose the 10 best books and you got your money back from the tuition oh, wow. of the course. And that was the biggest motivator for me. This was all before I was diagnosed, but now I look back and I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's totally what I would, <laughs> I'm, I'm cheap enough that that was like such a motivator for me to be like, I'll get all of my money back. Um, but there was the reason why they could do that is because so many people were in this course that they could afford to give 10 people their money back. And I just can't help but think about like all of the people that didn't get their book written and spent the money and still at the end of the day were like, oh, I guess I'll never write. You know, like I, I don't know, my heart goes out to all those people who who it didn't work for them because I feel like yeah. you're right. It is such it's so individualized in terms of what's going to motivate you and what's going to work. And, yeah. Yeah, I feel, I feel like, uh, I, like I should say no shade to anybody who's running that kind of thing. Like people do their own thing and, and all the rest of it. I, I think that's, I think on, in, in a lot of ways, that's a really good idea. It's like, if you, if you get your book done, that, you know, you, you get your money back. But in other ways, I'm a bit like, oh, not sure about that for, for, <laughs> a variety, for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, it's just like that. I don't know. My goal is always for people to get their books done, but also for them to be like really happy with them and proud of them as well. And so yeah, I just feel like I like to take a bit more of an a individualistic approach than kind of have a lot of people come through. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so now is there, um, is there advice that you give to an aspiring neurodivergent writer who feels like they have a book in them and they're just like, oh, I'll never get, I'll never get past all of this clutter of my head. Yeah, definitely. And I would say that it is entirely possible for um, anyone to write a book if they want to. Most people, like, I'm going to be honest, most people are not going to do it. They're just not. Um, and if you look at the stats, like every, almost everybody says they want to write a book. Almost nobody does it. So, um, so there's that. But I would also say you really have to want to do it as well. Um, because I think a lot of people come to it being like, oh, somebody's told me I should write a book. So I should write a book. Um, or I should write a book for my business because of this reason. Or I should write a book because of, you know, whatever other reason they're telling themselves. And it's like, well, I don't like the word should. Um, my friend Jocelyn calls it shoulding and, and masturbating. Um, and they're not, they're not uh, must, used to I haven't heard masturbate. That's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, all credit to Jocelyn for that one. But um, but yeah, and I just I just don't like that word. It's it's shame laden and it's stressful. And you know, I I do really well with deadlines, but they're deadlines because I want to meet them, not because not because I'm being kind of pushed. So I would say for a start, how you know how passionate are you about writing a book? Because if you're if you're not, then it's going to be really difficult for you if you get it done at all. Um, and secondly, kind of really think about what what you want. If you're if you're dead set on writing a book and you really want to do it, it's like what what do you want to write like what is enjoyable for you because i think quite often people desperately want to write a book but then they start on something that doesn't light them up and so that again it's always going to be difficult um, and i find the people that do the best are the ones who are willing to um, really look at what they want to do and what they want to say and how they want to say it and are also willing to write an absolute pile of shite frankly because like that's the other thing is like we set out we, we look at people's finished books and we're like oh they wrote a book I must write a book like that and it's like that is not what the book looked like to start with the book looked like a big pile of poo I can guarantee it um, and so like I always say to people because this is one of the biggest things that gets in the way people will say they haven't got time they haven't got this but I think a lot of the time it comes down to I'm scared it's going to be rubbish and it's like yeah your first draft is going to be rubbish I'm just going to say that right now it's going to be rubbish so instead of making you feel bad why don't you set out to write a big pile of crap like that's what I say to people set out to write a big pile of crap doesn't matter if it's a mess doesn't matter if it's all over the place that's you know we've got plenty of time afterwards to kind of come and do things I can't remember which writer said you can't edit a blank page but it's true um so like give yourself permission to be terrible at it to start with um that's and that's where the fun is because then we get to learn how to make it better and that for me is where the joy is is like yeah sometimes I will write a really great sentence off off the bat or a really great paragraph and I'll be like that is great how it is it doesn't happen very often and like for the rest of the time I'm like oh that's that's nonsense but the idea is in there you know the idea is in there and I can pull it out and make it into something worth reading so my biggest piece of advice is give yourself permission to write crap and then work from there yeah, right. And I mean, I feel like we could probably talk for another hour about perfectionism and ADHD and masking and all of that. So you had actually mentioned in your Instagram, there was a book that had was the best book that you had ever read about overcoming perfectionism. Do you know off the top of your head? 
oh, what that book was. Oh, I can put a link to it in the show notes because I remember seeing that Ooh. in your Instagram that you had shared this. Yeah, book. it was one of my. Yeah, it was one of my clients. Um, it was a micro book, she, right? It was a micro book. Yeah, and she wrote um, a little book called "Stop Falling Short." Um, stop falling short with air quotes. I need to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> stop falling short and. But she, so the reason that I loved it is because she took it from an abstract concept because humans are not good with abstract concepts, most of us. Um, and she took it from this kind of idea of, oh, perfectionism, blah, and put it into your body. And so she got, she, she gets you to think about what's happening in your body and use your physiology and your um, breath and your actions to, to change the way your brain thinks about things. And it just, I just loved it. It really spoke to me because I was just like, oh, I, can't, I know what perfectionism is. I'm not interested in like more abstract psycho babble. I want to know what I can do about it. Um, and that was the magic of this book for me was that she gave, she gives you, um, it's mostly kind of breathing exercise, but also kind of a few thought experiments, a few little bits and pieces to do. There's not too much stuff to do. Um, she wanted to keep it really light and simple. Um, but the, the core of it is, you know, change, change the way you breathe and change the way you're, you, you know, you are in your body to help you to, shift the perfectionism thing out and i'm explaining it very badly it's a very good book <laughs> I'll, I, now are they are the micro books for sale like could i find it on on amazon yeah it's, or... it is on amazon i bought it okay. from i bought it myself from amazon so yes um oh, her name okay, is great. Joanna so. Uh, I'll put a link to that as well as your, you have several books as too that we can find on your website right which is yeah Oh, you know what I also wanted to ask you and forgot, which is what is the what is the significance of tiny beetle steps? <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah. This right. So people often say, um This is your her start... Vicky's Instagram account, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so people always say, I'll start with baby steps, but baby steps are actually quite big. And I think for a lot of people, if you if you're like learning something new, and especially with if you've got the curse of knowledge, as you've already mentioned, it's like you know all this stuff, you forget what it's like right at the beginning. And so I'm like, how like make it as make it so tiny you can't fail. Like if if you're really struggling, and this goes back to and I, I can't remember her name, but um she wrote a book called The Science of Stuck, which I heard on the You Are Not So Smart podcast. This is where I buy all my books from listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. Um and she talked about and I loved it because she articulated what I had been thinking was um, if you're stuck, like procrastinating or whatever, just move. Like it might be just shift face in another direction. It might be cross your legs one side to the other. It's like, don't try and climb the mountain from being on the sofa because it ain't going to happen. So her, her thinking is movement changes your brain, right? The changing your state changes your brain, gets you unstuck in that way. And so that was my thinking behind, that was always my thinking behind tiny beetle steps. I was like, don't, don't try and do it in baby steps. They're too big. It's like, what is the what is the tiniest, tiniest step that you can possibly do? Make it so small you can't fail. So. I love that. That's awesome. Um, okay, wow. We're going to have a long list of links uh, for books to put in the episode show notes. I love that. Awesome. Okay, so um, remind me, what is your website? Oh, gosh, I'm totally blanking. That's okay. It is moxiebooks.co.uk. Oh, moxiebooks. Okay. Now, is that um, is that your imprint, or what is the what is moxiebooks? So that is my um, that's my trading name, um, and also my publishing imprint for my books as well. So yeah. awesome, wonderful. And now, if somebody wants to work with you one on one, there's a lot of information on your website. Is that the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, best way is to um, email me, vicky at moxiebooks.co.uk or DM me on Instagram or um, LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me um, or fill in my contact form on my website. Awesome. Well, what a, it's an incredible service and um, a wonderful way to, I, I feel like very grateful that, that, that this sort of coaching exists because I, I think it is really important for us to get past, get out of our own way, but also to realize that it's not something we're going to miraculously figure out how to do on our own. So stop pretending that you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, no wonder. Okay. So now before we go, can you, do you have a, a, an alternate name for ADHD? If you could rename it? Yeah. There are bees in my brain. Oh, nice. <laughs> It's a constant buzzing and they're all flying in different directions. So. <laughs> See, that is something I would have related to if somebody had asked me, you know, do you think you have ADHD? If we, if I knew it was, do you think you have bees in your brain? I'd be like, uh-huh, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
right? <laughs> um, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I definitely lean toward those ones that are much more literal than, you know, the the clinical ones about executive function and, and regulation. And that's, I was like, that I never would have related to any of that before my diagnosis. But if you told me oh. that, like, I constantly feel like I'm forgetting things and there's gnats flying around my head, I would have been like, yeah, that describes my experience. <laughs> yeah, that's like the very name is like, deficit and disorder i am yeah. a deficit and i am disordered and i'm like no i am not a deficit i'm awesome and the world is disordered so um <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, thank you, Vicky. This has been great. I um, I feel like thank I laughed so a lot. This has been really delightful. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing your story too. It's been lovely having you. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I've had an absolute whale of a time and I really, I love your podcast so much. It's really helped me so very much. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Here's the, where we awkwardly say thank you over and over again. Yeah. Like, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs>